In financial planning, preparing for educational cost is best begun early. It requires budgeting, savings, and understanding the various tools available. At the core of this preparation are 529 plans, tax advantage savings for future education costs. They come in two forms, prepaid tuition plans, which lock in today's tuition rates for the future, and education savings plans, versatile investment accounts for a range of educational expenses. Opening a 529 plan or similar savings account when a child is young can make a significant difference. Education often involves loans. Navigating federal versus private loans, interest rates, and repayment options are crucial. Scholarships and grants can play a major role in easing financial burdens. This planning should integrate into broader financial strategies, balancing with retirement savings and emergency funds. The aim is to create a holistic financial plan where education funding complements other life goals, ensuring a balanced and financially secure future for both parents and children. All right, this topic hits home for me. I have three kids who are uh, in high school, in middle school. Joe, you sent twins to college. You had a twofer. In what ways can families make education savings fun and engaging for both the parents and the children? Well, I don't, I, I don't know about fun, but the, the, come on, because, you can make everything fun. Well, that price tag, that price tag is so high that it that, that it's difficult. You, you, you know, the piece of that that we forget. You talk about children, and I think uh, 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 if you if you work with your family on really thinking about the future and what they want to do. My kids, when they were maybe sophomores in high school, we started to visit colleges. We started getting a feel for what that was. We also showed them what the price tag was and uh, started talking about the money that we'd save to put away. But the, but the piece that people forget about, I think, is actually a little bit wider than your question, Andy, which is getting the outer family involved. And what I mean is I had somebody last week ask me a question like, how do I stop the grandparents from giving my kids this stuff that fills their rooms with, you know, just junk that the kids aren't going to use, that they're not going to play with, that they're not going to have any fun with and, um, and get them to contribute to a 529 plan. And this woman I was talking to, she goes, Oh, I, you know, I, I said that to my mom, I'd really like you to contribute to their 529 plan. And grandma said, well, that's really boring. And, uh, and, and that doesn't sound fun at all. And I said, you know what? she should have said back. And it obviously depends on your relationship with your family. I'm obviously known as being a little sarcastic and having fun. And frankly, I also think you can say almost anything you want with a smile on your face and you can say, so you, I told her that she should say, well, it's a lot more fun than having a ton of student loans in college, which they're going to have. If you keep buying them the stuff, they're not going to use and don't help us help them get through college. And she actually thought that was that was a great idea. But I think empowering grandparents and relatives that um, to to stop with the birthday gifts and begin helping with stuff that uh, really going to make a difference in kids' lives. I like your approach. I think that you know introducing the time value of money on like stuffed animals, right. not that interesting. Right. My daughter Beanie would disagree. Babies. My daughter would disagree. She would disagree. I just want you to know. We have two hundred probably. Well, well, I think it's funny. It, it is funny, Mary Beth, because because in one way you're right, right? Like like putting money into a kid's five twenty nine plan. Like my kids, are like what? You stiff me on the birthday present? Like really? Yes. I should have gotten something. But my parents learned really quickly. There's kind of a halfway. You know, there's a there's an experience that they'll have that they can remember because experiences appreciate while the toys on the ground depreciate in value. And then the second piece was a contribution to college. So I think there is a middle ground there that um, we should be exploring. Best of both worlds. Great. Mary Beth, what's your approach? Any innovative financial tools or strategies that you recommend for funding a child's education? You know, it's a five to nine plan is always the, the way you know, that we kick it off. But really, it's about starting with the conversation about how if you're if you're in a couple, how you both feel about paying for college. So my, I myself paid my own way through college. My husband actually went to the Naval Academy, so he had to give time to the government. We, we covered our car costs. So when I came to the picture with student loans, though, I was like, yes, we're, we're saving for our children. My husband thought, no, we're not. 
So it was really about, you know, just as a case study, bringing him on board, talking about costs, educating him. And so you, you have the same with any clients, any couples, making sure they're on board, understanding, you know, what feels reasonable as parents that you want to contribute, understanding the student loan aspect of it all and talking through. And then, and then it goes five to nine. I do have clients who still are worried about, hey, what if my kid doesn't go to school? What are the options? Or, hey, how do I cover trade schools? What are these different options? And so we usually do five two nines, and then we can also do the after-tax savings as well. There's there's not actually a benefit there to, do, to doing that account, but that gives some flexibility. You know, hey, my kid might be an entrepreneur and might not go to college. What are my options? And so we're usually talking through that with the parents to understand what they want to pay, what they want to uh, allocate funds towards. But there are a variety option of options and it's really about your kid's personality, which comes out as you get older. So it usually can start with, you know, slow and steady automatic savings as the kids are younger, like mine are six and eight right now. I have no idea what they're going to do. So we're setting aside into five, two nines. We might pivot though. I might find out, you know, one wants to start a, a cookie business, who knows, but you know, you pivot along the way, but you start planning now, the, the earlier you save, the better. I mean, I look at my daughter's five, two, nine account right now, and we're just doing, you know, a small, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month into that account. And what the balance has become over time with that growth is, is amazing for what you can do and the impact you can make in terms of saving on student loans. Hopefully it's an AI cookie business. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Stephanie, are there common pitfalls in education, financial planning that should be avoided? Well, you know, it's so interesting because uh, contrary to my bio, uh, I've been doing this for 26 years and I've seen such a difference in how families are approaching it now. The numbers, the price is just so astronomical that families seem to be more open to thinking about, well, maybe they go to community college for a couple of years and then transfer. I have a very good friend who lives in California and you can go to a local community college two years. And I think if you have a certain GPA, you can transfer into some of the UC schools. Like they're looking at different options one of my clients is kind of in the tech world. She's like, my kid's not going to kind of go to college, right? He's going to learn to program and then he's going to do his own thing. So uh, one of the books that I recommend to people all the time is The Price You Pay for College by Ron Lieber. He's got a lot of great information and kind of about how the whole system works, but also he encourages families to think about what's important about college to you. What is it that you're expecting to get out of it? Is it the prestige of the big name on the diploma on the wall? Is it hobnobbing with the hoi polloi? Or is it one-on-one -on -one interactions with faculty? Is it you know just the experience of being an independent person living on your own? Getting clear as a family on what the value is to you helps you then make choices. There are 3,000 colleges or more in this country, and so many people only focus on the top very small percentage. There's kind of a broader world out there. Yeah, I, I I totally agree that that we don't widen the the lens enough. Um, and I also think, and because that decreases the cost of college, the other way, I think that we don't think about decreasing the cost of college. And I think a lot of people mess this up. We don't understand how expected family contribution works as as uh, we're saving for college. Because once I knew how exp expected family contribution worked with a lot of my clients back when I was a financial planner, I would then use expected family contribution to help them set up their, their savings so that we got our fair share. I certainly don't want to cheat a system, but I want to make sure that if I'm, a, if I'm eligible for something, I'm not a victim of having money in the wrong place. And what's, what's funny is I thought it was super complicated when I first started learning about expected family contribution. It isn't. And it actually makes sense. You know, parents are allowed to have a little bit of money as a reserve. You're allowed to have some money for your own retirement. Um, uh, I think knowing knowing where to put your money is a huge part of winning with uh, lowering the cost of college as well. Josh, what do you see working with clients? Because I, I hear stories where the parents are taking loans and putting off their retirement for the sake of their kids' education. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean that can be that can be super frustrating as you're as you're looking through uh, trying to work through financial planning with people because a lot of times there's a lot of stuff to be done but not all of the money or resources available to do all of the things. Um, I can't I can't tell you how much the time value of doing a little bit all the time matters. I have a nephew who's get uh, he's a junior in college this year. And when he was uh, born, my wife and I started just a little bit $50 a month into a 529 plan. We forgot all about it. 
um, except, you know, saw that it came out and went to, you know, went to the 520. I would never, never got the statements, didn't really pay any attention to it. As he was starting his journey into college, uh, we got to kind of uh, live vicariously through him in terms of the offers and the scholarships and the grants and all the different combinations of schools and and cost structure that that he was being offered. And he selected the one that gave him the best value. Um, and then he said, I, I said to him, I said, well, we have some money set aside for you. And I looked and we had over $15,000 in a 529 plan in 18 years um, with $50 a month contributions. It's just, you know, which was, which was the better part of two and a half years worth of his out-of-pocket costs, all because of $50 a month. Now that's not zero, but it's also not a lot. And um, I'm right there with you, Andy. My kids are uh, 17, 15 and and Caroline will be eight. So it's, um, <laughs> I've got, I've got, we're, we're breathing down the neck of, of writing big checks for college, but it's, um, all of the stuff that we've, that we've talked about here, I think is super important and getting the kids engaged in this. We, we discussed it with our, with our kids early enough that, you know, there's two ways to pay for school. You know, one of the ways is for you to get a scholarship or, or a grant. And another way is to earn the money and write a check. So if you want to work, if you want to have a job through school, that's totally fine. But if you're not going to work, we expect that your job is to be great at school. And that's the that's the trade off. You know, if you don't want to have to uh, uh, have a part time job and you can or don't have to. But if you don't, then then your job is to make sure that you're great at school. So um, they've largely done that, which which hopefully will be will be uh, reward. They'll be rewarded for for being good students uh, in their decision. So. And we partially covered your face there, Josh, I, that's for okay. a second. That's kind of part of the course. We were showing that Tina has a, a child who had a combination of AP credits, scholarships, a work co-op, and student loans. And a second and third child have a combination of community college and MET, MET plans for university. Um, that is great. Yeah. I know that we all of have those a, things matter, right? All of those things yeah, are, you know, you can, it, it, everybody's going to be great at different things. You know, if you're a 4.0 student and test really well and get a 1600 on your SAT, that's awesome. You're going to get a lot of money from universities in different places to go to, 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 to offset some of that cost. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you should be out, you know, doing your entrepreneur things that generate, uh, revenue and generate good, good, uh, uh, good value for people around you, and that'll be how you pay for school. So there's no right or wrong way to do it, but but you Josh, definitely have to any think about it. any comment on how families can navigate the complex world of scholarships, grants, and financial <laughs> aid. <laughs> I, I I wish that I had the silver bullet for this one because we are we are like at the starting line for it. Um, no, I don't have anything to add other than I know that there's seven million opportunities. And, the, and near as I can tell, and the most of the stuff that I read, most people just barely scratch the surface on opportunities and don't, don't take full advantage. I'll give you a great example of this. My middle kid is a freshman in high school this year. And last year, part of their school curriculum was they had to write an essay about, I don't know, it was something like what the flag means to them or something, something patriotic. And what we didn't know was that they were submitting all of these to the the vfw into various veterans organizations and and the essay that my son wrote received third place in the state of texas and he got an award we didn't even know what was happening he got an award and a small check it was you know whatever 250 dollars or something um to be used for his tuition at his school and and it was it, it really kind of drove home the fact that there's all of these little bits of things we talk about you know say fifty dollars a month well my gosh if you can go get you know, your books paid for, or you can get, you know, the dining plan paid for and these little bitty increments of things. Um, you're already doing this stuff. So, so, so take advantage of all of the opportunities that are out there. And there's probably, well, they're not probably, there are way more, uh, than, than just the broad, you know, the big, big scholarship things you see advertised from the schools. Yeah. I'm hearing That's, from, from yeah. parents who are slightly ahead of me. They're like, there are merit-based scholarships that, you know, kids can seek out and just do the homework and yeah, try I, to apply. I had one too, Andy, from personal experience, which was, you know, filling out the FAFSA 
I watched my clients fill it out back when I was a financial planner and it was always a bear. It, um, uh, I know they've made it a little bit easier, but just take it question by question and fill it out. Um, and if you get nothing your freshman year, most people give up. And what my daughter found, we got nothing freshman year and, and starting uh, sophomore year got a little bit of financial aid. But starting with my daughter's junior year, that's when organizations and companies began giving her scholarships. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Uh, organizations that want literacy usually fund freshmen and sophomores. Uh, people in college have no idea, like Mary Beth was talking about her eight-year-old, no idea what your eight-year-old is going to do yet. Freshman in college often is going to still change their major twice, right, before they get to junior year. So when kids get to become a junior, that's when companies start giving scholarships because they want to use it as a recruiting tool. And my daughter did much better her junior and senior year than she did her freshman and sophomore year. So I would tell people a big mistake people make is they give up too early, keep a applying every single year because the people handing out money change over time. I would also say you just don't underestimate the amount of time that you spend in this area. I think a lot of parents and people are caught off guard with the amount of research that you need to do. And so whether it's hiring a consultant to assist with you, if you have that kind of privilege in your family and you're able to afford it, or just getting a head start on it when the kids are transitioning, as, as OG mentioned, into college, or sorry, into um, high school early on, starting on to just looking at scholarships, looking at what's available, because it is, you almost need to project manage this. It's, you can set up a 529 plan and assume that you'll have enough money but you still need to project manage getting your kid into college. I'm working with my sister right now and making sure my nephew's got his SATs. He's doing setting for the exam. And even those, those SATs, the exams are booked out months in advance. So if you're not getting in early for that, that impacts your college application. And so don't underestimate the amount of time and how early you need to start in this. I'm throwing everything up against the wall. I was talking to my 16 year old last night because I met a Miss New Jersey pageant winner. And I told my daughter, I said, maybe you should consider uh, pageantry and this is this is the daughter who does not want to wear any makeup and does not like to wear dresses so she's like yeah I don't think that one's for me but I'm willing to <laughs> keep my eyes and ears open so you got to make sure there's a good fit uh, we're going to go to segment three